Alrighty, everyone, welcome back. Today is our last day of light bulbs uh, or the black body radiator. And after this week, we're going to get off into quantum mechanics finally, which will carry us through most of the rest of the semester. We have an extra hour today as well. It's our last extra hour before the exam uh, because uh, the, the next extra hour will be a review session. And I'm going to have that on Wednesday uh, right before the exam. Uh, because why wouldn't I? Uh, let's see. Uh, in the next hour, in the next hour, I'm going to be doing some example problems, uh, problems that will most definitely appear on the test. Not exactly, of course, but very, very like. I'm going to do some Maxwell Boltzmann type questions, but I'm not going to do average velocity because you can just rewind the videos and watch that. Uh, you can look at that silly textbook. The main thing is, and I hope you really take this to heart. I am not going to ask anything that can just be repeated verbatim from a, a lecture or whatever is in the textbook. What's the point of that? You're just then, then the strategy is just memorize, try to or or, <laughs> or have the notes in front of you, uh, just repeat it, and then you can just forget it. So that's useless. So instead, I'm going to show you an example problem of what you can expect, which would be like number of COVID patients per hospital, um, something like that. And I, what, what I'll do is, and I, I can do this differently every year, uh, is just come up with a probability distribution and then you have to find the average value, right? So it's, it's fairly straightforward. These will actually be really easy, but if you're just trying to memorize, oh, maybe he'll ask this equation, I'll memorize it, I'll, I'll have it in front of me somehow. That's absolutely not gonna work, so anyway. Uh, a lot of people sometimes don't do well on the first test, but don't worry about it. There's two more tests after that and a final, which equals all three. <coughs> um, if you don't do well on the first test, don't worry about it. People can recover no problem, right? so, so don't want you stressing out about it. Okay, anyway, I'm babbling on about tests. We don't have to worry about that yet. One thing, let's, we're going to finish up the Planck distribution, and I know that this has been, this is, mathematically quite rough because this is a derivation that technically took me all week, you know, three lectures to do one derivation. I'm not going to do anything quite like that, even when we get into quantum, close, but not quite. Uh, but I hope at the same time it's not been too difficult to understand, right? It's just a light bulb. Uh, when we get into quantum next week, the mathematics for the first month is going to be like really child, it's, it's like just taking derivative of cosine. Right? It's going to be childlike, uh, but the interpretation is going to be difficult. So anyway, just heads up that, you know, I know this has been rough with all these equations across the board um, from uh, Monday to Wednesday, and today I'm going to tie them together, um, but this is going to be really the last time that we just have equation after equation after equation three days straight. Okay. With that said, let me review what we did Monday and Wednesday, because today we're going to tie it together. And we're going to be able to calculate that spectrum of that light bulb that we kind of failed to describe so far. Also, you know, I realized I hadn't written this down, and that was actually a big mistake for me. Um, that that spectrum from the light bulb, from the sun, the black body radiator, that is called a Planck distribution. Uh, just like Maxwell Boltzmann was for velocity, Planck is for a light bulb. So anyway, I, I should have mentioned that that's the word for that. Okay, Planck started, uh, sorry, how did, how did we start out with this? Hopefully not too hard, right? We had the Boltzmann distribution and we used it to calculate the average energy for a certain wavelength of light coming from an object that's hot, like a, like a little fireplace poker, which hopefully you've all, you know, Christmas time, right? You've poked the logs when you were kids in, in the fireplace. Of course, you let it get hot till it glows red. And for some reason, that's kind of cool when you're really little. So you know that hot objects emit light. So what we're doing is we're, we're using the Boltzmann distribution to calculate the average energy for whatever wavelength of light. And the way to do that, of course, is we have a sum of all possibilities, the Boltzmann distribution for energy times energy. And here, there's a couple of things to know. For one, what's in the sum? 
The sum is not wavelength, but rather number of photons, which clearly goes from zero to infinity. So just like when we were doing Maxwell-Boltzmann, and energy was one half mv squared, velocity, you know, one half mv, v being velocity, velocity ends up being our mathematical handle that we worked on. Here is number of photons, right? And that's because energy of a photon, of course, is uh, Planck's constant uh, times the frequency, or h over lambda, but you can have more than one photon. Right? So, yeah, so n is the number of photons. Okay, so uh, with that, we also ran into another thing that actually kind of made this easier. I didn't have to turn the Boltzmann distribution into a whole bunch of integrals, like, you know, turn the normalizer into an integral. Uh, we found identities on Google that did, that, that gave us an identity for the sum, right, for, the, for the sum. And that was because n goes as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And because of that, some mathematician figured out what e to the minus a times n, uh, how that sum converges to what we solved um, on, mon yeah, Monday. Okay, and, and then once we had solved the normalizer for the probability distribution of energy, we were still able to, to use a sum, and we didn't have to like go off into integral band. And uh, from that, we were able to solve the average energy for a particular wavelength of light. And that was nice. In fact, I would hope it was actually a little bit easier than what we did with Maxwell Boltzmann. The problem we have, though, as much as, again, I hope that this was actually easier than Maxwell Boltzmann, the problem we have is that when we plot this sucker, average energy for a particular wavelength versus wavelength, what we got looked like this. The problem is, and you remember this graph at the, I think I gave this at the end of lecture last time, is that our light bulb spectrum looks like the dotted line, and this thing is the solid line, and those are not the same, right? So here's where the difficulty, uh, the greater difficulty is found for this part of the class. Okay, so uh, before we figure out what's wrong with this, which, again, also, this is Monday's lecture. I'll start with you Wednesday's lecture. Uh, let me just point out, I don't think I mentioned this last time. The reason it just basically rises and rises is because what you're comparing, the result of this probability analysis is, what is the probability that a light bulb would generate, let's say, like an X-ray or a gamma ray? Let's go crazy, right? Gamma rays are really high energy. Well. It depends on the energy of the photon divided by kT. So a light bulb may be 5,000 degrees and kT is correspondingly bigger than room temperature. That is a small number compared to the energy of a gamma or X-ray photon. So when I turn on the light bulb, it's very improbable that it's going to start spewing out X-rays. It could, it's just improbable. Okay, so that's why there's, not, there's nothing to short wavelength, which is high energy, but to long wavelength, which is low energy, if those photons, if the individual photon's energy is much less than kT, then you can have a bunch of them. And indeed, you do, that's what our mathematical analysis show. Okay, that's wonderful. Okay, but again, it's not the answer. <laughs> What's wrong with that? All right, now we're, now we're on Wednesday's lecture. Wednesday's lecture, was um, we started on DiffyQ, right? And I know that this was probably a lot of your first introduction to DiffyQ. I know that, but, um, but I'm covering it, right? I think that's fair. Now, one of the things that fascinates me about DiffyQ is that, uh, okay, so we're at the final exam in DiffyQ1, whichever class that is, and this is the question. Maybe it's the last question. And recall that this differential equation actually comes from Maxwell's laws. It's a, it's a simple derivation from Maxwell's equations, which you should have had in physics too. And anyway, here it is. And it's like, imagine that you're sitting there in the exam, and this is the question. And you're like, well, well what? <laughs> what do I do with that? 
what you do with it, again, if you're a mathematician, you would know this. And, and I'm telling you this, I know this is probably the first time you've seen this. What you're trying to do is find a function that makes this work. And unfortunately, since this is the electric field of light, Maxwell's equations is for electromagnetism, light is an electromagnetic wave, therefore Maxwell's equations has to apply to it. I use the letter E for the electric field of light, which is common. Unfortunately, it's also E as an energy, but they're not the same. We're going to run into some problems where there's only so many letters in the alphabet, including the Greek alphabet. So we're going to have this happen one or two more times. So this is a different E, right? This is the electric field of light. Now, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for that function that makes this work. The reason that I like to bring this up this whole Planck distribution light bulb thing before quantum is that this Maxwell equation deal is very similar to the Schrodinger equation. It's very similar to quantum mechanics. And just like quantum mechanics, we set it up and then because it's not Diffie-Q, this class is not Diffie-Q, what I will do more often than not is show you what the answer looks like. And here it's sine, uh, let's see, that, that n thing, uh, pi x over l, and I have one for y, pi y over l, and these are all multiplied, obviously, and you're going to figure out why they're multiplied on the homework versus like added. That would be the other possibility. Uh, the solutions are not, are not added. Um, 2 pi, I had to, I'm kind of doing this from memory, I hope I didn't screw this up. Uh, that's the solution, and so what I'm going to do is in quantum and here, so this, this is basically how we're just going to do things up until basically the end of the semester is, we're going to write this jump down, I shouldn't call it jump, and then I'm just going to give you the answer. Now, there's a couple of things we can do from here. I'm not going to prove it again, but recall when I was talking about basic properties of Diffie Qs, I pointed out to you that each term by itself is actually a constant. Now the reason that is, is uh, it's a little bit easier to see if I bring that time term over to the uh, left. I, you know, it's nutty, right? Because here's a double derivative, and here's like a sine function with x in it. All right, well, that's going to still leave a sine function. So these look like, you know, derivative of a function is, is a function, usually. But it turns out that that can't happen because look how these have to add up to zero, right? It's like a plus b plus c minus whatever. It has to be zero. How can functions in different dimensions, oh, oh, and then let's make one time because why not? How can they work together that if you're doing this, then I'm doing that? Oh, and then Z and T will figure it out too. Uh, how can that happen? The answer is it can't. Each term is actually a constant. Because functions, I don't think they're going to subtract each other out. Not that that's impossible, but it's unlikely. And in fact, it is impossible when you're talking about different dimensions, because different dimensions don't really see each other. But constants, A plus B plus C minus A plus B plus C, that can be zero. That, that's not hard at all. You know, subtracting two numbers and getting zero is very easy. And it turns out to be the case. All right, now, we plug this sucker. Uh, once, once we have a solution to the Diffie Q, we plug it in and then you learn new things. Now, I know that this seems disconnected from what we're trying to do, but you're going to see the connection, of course, here in a minute. Okay, and I'm going to do a little bit of factoring. Um, you, you should be able to, you, you don't have calculus to do this. So what happens is there's this pi squared over L squared. Pi squared over L squared is common to each term, so I factor that out and end up with an X squared plus an Y squared plus an Z squared. And those are from X, Y, and Z. And then the time deal, um, 2 squared pi squared lambda squared uh, equals to 0. Okay, now that's very doable. Okay. Now, whenever I see like anything that looks like x squared plus y squared plus z squared, 
I can I can say that that's like a radius. I'm just instead of r, I'm going to call it m squared. That's an awful looking at it. It's like a messed up h. There we go. It has to be perfect, or the world will explode. There we go. And if I do that, then I can simplify this quite a little bit better. And let me do that. What I'm going to say is n squared is 4L squared over lambda squared. Um, so there we go. Now, what about this? Let me remind you what these n's are. I, I should have actually started out with that. That was kind of stupid of me. So remember that we're, just, we're working on the geometry of a light bulb. Oh, that's an awful looking light bulb. It'll have to do. So we're describing a light bulb. And of course, its dimensions are L. And recall that um, to, to get back to our problem of describing the Planck distribution, the, the intensity uh, spectrum of the light bulb, um, the way that those n sub x, n sub y, n sub z work are, and, and I'm going to tell you what, they, they have a special name, they're called mode numbers. So it's called a mode number, and that's n, x, y, and z. Okay. So at, for a low mode to a high mode, high mode numbers, remember that their job was to allow light to fit into the box. So for low mode numbers, um, you know, you don't have too many zero crossings. And for high mode numbers, you have, I'm exaggerating here, of course I didn't show anything quite like this um, on Wednesday. Of course it goes from zero to L. Um, and don't get confused by this. I've seen a lot of times people mess this up on exams. Mode with an M, mode. Recall that a zero crossing in a function is a node. Node with an M, mode with an M. Okay. So the mode numbers in X, Y, Z, when there, when it's like two or three, you get a wave like this. When it's like 50 or 60, you get a wave like that. So what they do is they allow the waves to fit in the box, box, but notice that as the mode number increases, the wavelength decreases, which of course we know to be higher energy. So just saying. All right, all right, so what about that? Okay, let's look back here. Let's look, let me go back here for a second. This guy tells me what waves fit in the box. Okay, so that, uh, I can solve that for lambda. Um, 2L over M. Okay, cool. All right, now, now let's go back to here. Let me go back here. What this is showing me is that only certain waves fit in the box. And now they're actually really close together, by the way, but I'm just trying to exaggerate. So what I'm doing is I'm pointing towards the lambdas that are okay to fit in the box. That's what I'm doing. So I pointed that out. All right, so what? Now, as I mentioned before, one of the things that this part does to make this average energy, this average energy equal the spectrum is that it doesn't allow there to be any energy at long wavelengths because there's no waves that fit in the light bulb at long wavelengths. So, and at short wavelengths, the opposite happens, which is what today's lecture is about. Okay, so there's that. So there's a cutoff. There's at some point, um, at very long wavelengths, there's no more waves. So I can see how this average energy is going to get bent down to equal the spectrum, and then we have to worry about the high energy part, and that's coming up in just one second. Okay, so I can see that part. But now, um, but notice that the average energy, all right, so I see how it's going to get bent down, but then how does it get bent up, right, and, and then back down? Anyway, how does that part happen? All right, now, this is, this is, Kind of obvious, but you're going to have to like put a bunch of stuff in your head. Here's what's happening. Uh, I'm going to make a little graph, and I have this available to you. Uh, I have a PowerPoint, and I'm going to put the PowerPoint into this lecture, and 
And um, anyway, okay. So here's where this gets kind of interesting. All right, now for any particular set of, um, we call it, okay, so, so n squared is nx squared. I don't know why I'm, I'm writing, I already wrote this down, right? That's basically here, but I want to write it down again because I want, to, I want you to really see what I'm doing here. Okay, for any particular wavelength, the wavelength is a function of nx and ny and nz because it gives me n and then there's my allowed wavelength, right? I, I, right, this is like high school, like, like junior level stuff. Okay, so let's think of, uh, nx, ny, nz of one, each one is one, All right, three dimensions. Now let's see, what would be n squared? That would be one squared plus one squared plus one squared, uh, that would be three, okay. So, uh, so there you go. Okay, so um, how, many, how many modes are there? Now this is the new part, let me point this out. There's permutations you can make. Of, of these. Now, in this case, 1, 1, 1, there's only one way to arrange three ones to get an n squared of three. So, number of modes is one. And then you can calculate the, the wavelength. I'm, I'm not going to write that down. It's right, it's right there. I just, I just want to remind you that for any particular n squared, I can correlate that to a wavelength. That's why I'm just putting a little blah, blah, blah. I don't want to, anyway. Okay, now, all right, now, this is probably like, like what, the, what the heck am I doing? Okay, now let me point this out. Let's do one, one, two. Okay, now n squared would be one plus one plus four, and that's six, and so n squared is six. However, now you see where this gets a little bit more complicated. One, uh, one, sorry, one, two, one, as an n squared of six, and so does two, one, one. Okay, so, Look at that, there's three of these, and of course I can calculate the, the wavelength, which would be shorter and whatnot. So you see, as n squared increases, which means that you're going to shorter wavelength, the number of modes increases. Now, to get all dramatic, n squared for a typical light bulb, those can get like 10 to the like, 10 to the 15. Those are the types of n squares we can see. So let me put like a really big number that my computer was able to, to work on. Uh, so what I did was uh, I picked three numbers. I picked 60, 60, 60. Um, now it sounds like there's only one of those. Uh, 60 squared plus 60 squared plus 60 squared is 10,800. Okay, then what I did was I asked my computer to find every combination of, of some x and y and z squared that equals 10,800. And you know what? It came up with 28 possibilities. 28 combinations of whole numbers squared sum to 10,800. Now again, this n squared for a light bulb, you have to go to really, really high, 10, 000, that's not a big number, 10 to like 15 or something. To, really, really big numbers. And that means that this number of modes is going to increase further and further. Now, the effect of that is, and you saw me do this graphic, let me explain it and then I'll put the graphic on it, is that as you get shorter, I've identified the wavelengths, but let's, let's represent this, this, in, this higher number of modes, which is technically the word is the degeneracy, by making these like little posts. So let me do my graphic, my, my graphic right there. Uh, I'm putting this in front of me so I can talk about it. But what you see is, is that the posts get longer. And as they get longer, they can accommodate, like for every mode, it has its own delta E of energy, which means that it gets more photons. So, so this guy gets like one average E, which corresponds to a certain number of photons. This maybe gets two average E's. So this gets three, this gets five, this gets nine, this gets 20, this gets 40, this gets 100. Anyway, it like goes up and up and up. So the number of photons um, increases as you go to the left, and it just goes up and up and up, which is what we're going to prove right now. 
Okay, so, uh, and, and as my little graphic shows, what you do is you can think of these like little posts, and the photons are like little, like, you know, little um, cylinders with a hole drilled with them. And so as much as there's a whole bunch of photons in here, you have to fill, you can only fill the uh, posts so far until you run out of, you run out of modes, you run out of posts. And so you keep filling the ones to low energy, high wavelength. You have an infinite number of photons, but you don't have many modes. Then there's a crossover. You have really, really lots of room for more photons, but you don't have many photons. And when you multiply those two things together, you get the Planck distribution. You get the right looking, you get the answer. You, you get the spectrum of the light bulb. That's where we're going. Okay, now with that said, I hope, God, I hope I made that clear. I know this is kind of rough. Now we have to do the calculus to determine how to mathematically create these posts. So I, to get, uh, I, I, know where, I know where the posts are, but now how do I know how, how tall they are, right? Which is, the, which, is, which is this number right here. How do I determine these numbers given uh, as a function? I want, I want that to be a function of n squared. Now, how do I do that? Okay, so I'm going to have to power point this, and this is rough. Um, uh, it, it, sorry, the, hopefully the PowerPoint will be very enjoyable and informative, and you're totally going to get it. What I'm complaining about is I'm not doing that now. I'm, gonna, I'm filming this now. I'm going to go back to my office and then film the PowerPoint and put that in. So I don't know what I'm going to say in the future. I can tell you about why she won't call me back. Oh, God. Anyway, all right. With that said, I'm going to put in the PowerPoint, uh, wipe out the board, and when we come back, we'll have seen the equation that relates n squared to the number of modes. And that, we just, we then work with the average energy and we get the Planck distribution. Okay, everyone. Now, to make this as easy as possible, what we're going to do is we're going to solve the two-dimensional case, and that's because we can do a lot of things graphically. Now, recall that what we're trying to do here is we're trying to relate the, the net mode number here to the number of modes. So, what I've done is I've graphed uh, nx and ny, and, and again, it's two-dimensional, so let's just forget, we're going to forget nz for now. And of course, n squared is nx squared plus ny squared. Uh, so I'm drawing like like the radius. I'm drawing the square root of that. So that is again, it's analogous to a radius. All right. So for any particular radius, I can associate a, a certain value of nx and ny for that, of course. And what I need to do is then count the number of modes corresponding to that radius. Now, what that means in this graph is I have to count the number of points for which, which are whole numbers of nx and ny uh, from 0 to, to um, infinity, technically, but here from 0 to 10. I have to count the number of points that cross that line. And I've done that for a certain number of uh, net mode numbers here. And you can see, like in the case of 4, you only see the, this, top, this top and bottom one. Uh, there's only two points that cross the line. You see a couple more for 5, and you would expect that to increase, but when you look at 7, 8, or 9, you see that a lot of points come close, but they never quite cross. So it, it looks like we're, we're obviously going to be missing a lot of points, because none of them just really are going to lie perfectly on one of these lines. So it looks like I have a bit of a problem here. I don't see a very good way to relate this, uh, this net mode number, n squared, to the number of, a number of modes, which again are the, the points that, that cross a, um, a, a, a half circle, a quarter circle, um, with that radius. Okay, so we need to resolve that. How do we do that? All right. What I could do is, it, it's obvious that some of these points just simply aren't ever going to, they're not going to touch a line, not, not ever. But if I give myself some some width, if, if I describe an area, I can easily count all the points within that area. And so now what I'm doing is I'm going to count the number of points within this area of this quarter disk. All right, now how does that work out? Let's see here. Okay, now in this case, in this case I can perfectly count that there's there's 20, 20, you know, 20 uh, mode num uh, modes 
in this uh, shaded area. Okay, that's that's all fine and good. Uh, if I go further out, um, I can again count the number of points and it increases sensibly and further and further and further. Now I'm at a radius of 8 and the number of points is 34. So, so this is making a lot of sense, right? So if I just give myself a little bit of a spread and radius and then I count the number of points, I can see that I get a line, although it looks a little bumpy. That actually, you know, is something wrong? No, it makes sense that it's a little bit bumpy because, as you can see in the graph, some points are barely in and some points are barely outside of this disk. And, and there's not much we can do about that, but it looks like I've got a, a straight line here. So what I could do is I could probably fit a line to that and that would work just great. But I think I can understand why I have a line. Let's look a little further here. Okay. Now remember that instead of relating this net mode number n squared to the number of modes, I'm now relating area. Okay, what is the relationship between area and number of modes? Okay, so let's look at the point 1, 1, right? nx is 1 and y is 1, and that's one point. What is the area of that point on this graph? Well, that's 1 times 1, which is 1. All right, so it looks like I have a relationship between the number of modes and the, the area of said modes. All right, let's add some points to make sure that we've, we've got an understanding here. Let's add two more points, all right? So now I have three points, and what's the area of these three points? Well, each one picks up one unit of area, so three points gives me three units of area. Four gives four points, has four units of area, on and on and on, right? So you see that what's happening here is I can relate the the number of points to the to the area of the same number of points and, and it's the same number. So here, when I'm looking at a radius of eight and I give myself a certain spread, is that 34 points? Is that is that is that the same as this area of this quarter disk? All right, let's test that theory. Uh, we know that the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, but we're only looking at a quarter of a disk, so 1 half pi r. And then if I looked at uh, delta r, which I gave myself a delta r of 2, what do we get? Okay, here's the data that you just saw uh, earlier, and here's a graph of a line of 1 half pi r times a change, uh, delta r of, of a half, of 2. And if you look at, if you look, I mean, they're both lines, and if you look at the X and Y, you see that they're basically, they are not basically the same, they're, they're exactly the same thing. All right, now our job is to do the same thing for uh, in three dimensions. All right, now without proving it, and you can see why I did two dimensions. In three dimensions, what I'm doing is I'm plotting the number of points but I have to do it as a volume, right? In two dimensions, you saw me plot the points as an area, and you could see all the points, but in three dimensions, it's a lot harder to see. So as you go further and further with your radius, um, it's a little hard to visualize, but what I hope that you accept is, is that it's the radius of a shell. The number of points is the volume of the shell, just like before, it was the area of, of a disk. And as you can see here, that really works out quite well. All right, we're back. I hope that PowerPoint made a lot of sense. And now we can finish up. We're almost done. And I see I don't have much time left, so this is perfect. So to summarize those PowerPoints, the, hopefully you could really follow along with the 2D example, how the number of modes, which is what we're trying to calculate, the number of modes is related to that area of, of a disk really similar to what we had to, we ran into that with Maxwell Boltzmann as well. However, in 3D, really what you've got, uh, the number of modes, the number of points within a, a volume was, uh, well, let's write down, it's just the volume. It's just the volume. Uh, where instead of an R squared, we have an N squared. And of course, the shell width is, is a partial, uh, with one slight problem being that nx and ny and nz are all positive, and if we think about a coordinate system, you know, z, x, and y, positive numbers are only in one-eighth the first coordinate. So we divide this by eight, and this, of course, is our number of modes, as you just saw. And, you know, I'm a little flummoxy because I'm trying to remember what's in that PowerPoint. I made that last year. But anyway, so I'm pretty sure this is what's in it. Okay. Problem. 
All right, now I can see that I set myself up for having to do an integration. And I'm integrating n. And I don't like that because for a couple of reasons. n is a very abstract. I like wavelength. Wavelength I understand. I understand 550 nanometers is green. I understand 620 is red, 620 nanometers is red. So I have a very good sense of wavelength. Now, the Planck distribution, which is our endpoint, what I do is I take these number of modes and I multiply by the average energy, which I express as wavelength. So what I really want to do here is I want to change this expression into wavelength. Uh, and of course, I know how to express wavelength based on Planck, uh, based on um, our Maxwell equations, right? Remember this? I uh, using Maxwell's equations and the proper function for the electric field of light, we got this relationship. Okay, so we plug that in, and so that's pi halves um, n squared four l squared over lambda squared. Um, let me make sure that I'm doing this right. There we go. All right, so that's the number of modes. Gotcha. Remember, you've got a test coming up. The first part of your test, I've told you this many times now, the first part of your test is a question and I work the answer, but I work the answer incorrectly. Your job is to identify that because you know, giving right answers is something that if you've made it this far, you're pretty good at. I don't know that that's that useful. You want to be a doctor and you have a healthy patient, there's nothing for you to do. You have to figure out what's wrong. That's where you're valuable. And what did I do wrong? My job is to get rid of the, the M's and replace them with lambdas, but I didn't do the partial. Now to do the partial, and hopefully you watched the extra hour last week, you know that the solution is to take the partial of N, divide and multiply by the partial of wavelength. Now there's an absolute value sign in case you run into a minus when you're doing a Jacobian. If you run into a minus sign, that's the same thing as flipping the order of integration, uh, flipping the limits, and you're not supposed to do that. So that you put in an absolute value if you run into a minus sign. Okay, so if we do this, so remember this is still number of modes, uh, we ended up with uh, 2L squared over lambda squared, the change in N as a function of Wavelength is 2L over lambda with respect to lambda. And you know, if you ever run into, uh, I, I still struggle with taking the derivative of, of 1 over x, 1 over x squared. Just make the exponent negative, right? So this is lambda to the minus 1. 2L lambda to the minus 1. And then it's very easy for me to remember to bring down the minus and then it's lambda to the minus 2 over lambda squared. And you can see why we, did I get a pi? I forgot a little, ah, oh, jeez. I should fix that with digital, but, but I won't. Um, as I mentioned before, sometimes, you know, I'm not terribly upset to make a mistake every now and then, because it's like ridiculous for me not to, to, to make no mistakes. That, that's absurd. Um, and I've made many mistakes here. I forgot my, my partial of the lambda. Right? That, that's, that's bad. Okay. So again, I got 2 pi L squared, uh, and then uh, lambda squared. And that's going to be a lot of mistakes, didn't I? Okay, then I've got minus 2 L over lambda squared. And now you can see why I needed the, the absolute value. And so what have I got? I got 4 pi L squared over lambda to the fourth, chain with respect to lambda. Okay, and let me double check that. I seem to all of a sudden my, my head suddenly stopped working. Um, uh, and so that's lambda, lambda Q, lambda Q, jeez. Yeah, jeez, squared, yeah, sorry. God, I don't know why you did. Engine just stopped running. Anyway, so, but that's correct. All right, last thing, last thing. It turns out I have to apply a correction factor to this. And this is something I'm kind of surprised that a lot of, you know, I've done this class many times and I've asked students, have they ever heard of this before? And they almost universally say no. 
And that's surprising. So, but then again, it's a good opportunity to fix it. So here's a little aside. Don't write this down. Remember, uh, just um, what it was. It was Wednesday, right? Wednesday, I talked about how light, what light looks like as an electric field up and down, sine wave, right? And you had that in your previous science classes and whatnot. So sine, yeah, sine function. Okay, digital. Turns out that's not true. <laughs> uh, light has angular momentum. And if light has angular momentum, it has to rotate, right? So that's what you're seeing here. Uh, and you see why I'm having to do the digital. It's really hard to represent that on a flat board. And so if you're already confused, here's my point. When we've drawn light as a plane wave, we were lying. That's not what light looks like. And so you've been lied to your whole life. <laughs> Why do we do it? Think about this. How were your instructors supposed to draw this? Oh, sorry, how were they supposed to draw that? It's like kind of impossible, right? Yeah, actually, I mean, that's why I'm doing the digital. This is way easier, and you get 99% of what you need to know about light can be done with this plane wave. But that's not true. Light's got to, it's, it's got to rotate. It's got to rotate or it doesn't have angular momentum. So hopefully you can see that. But if it's rotating, it can rotate two different ways. It can rotate right-handed or it can rotate left-handed. So, so here's my point. For any given wavelength of light, there's two forms. So with the digital go away, you have to multiply this by two for left and right polarized light. So the number of modes is actually 8 pi, hopefully I won't mess anything else up. There we go. That's the real equation for the number of modes due to this left and right circularly polarized light. OK, with that, you know what? We're basically done. To generate the Planck distribution, all I'm going to do is, oh, God. All the blackboards in our learning centers, the middle one is always stuck. It's just stuck in every room. I don't know why they don't fix that. Anyway, here's the plank distribution. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do one last little, little thing. I'm going to take our equation for the average energy as a function of wavelength, and I'm going to multiply that by the number of modes, but I'm going to divide that by volume. Now, the reason I'm doing that is back in the day, they want, you know, people are, seriously, they're building the first light bulbs back in 1900. I want to give you information that you can use, but I can't presume that you're building the same light bulb I am. I'm going to give you an equation that you then can apply to whatever you're making. Uh, and the, the, of course, the difference would be how big is my light bulb versus yours. So what I do, to give you information that's useful, I give you its energy density. The energy, which hopefully is obvious, right? Average energy times the number of ways you can have a, a, a wavelength. Um, but I'm going to divide it by the volume, the volume of my, of my light bulb. And now you can see why I, I, I'm always describing, you know, the black body radiator is a box because the volume is L cubed. So anyway, right, so what do we get? Uh, let's see, uh, it ends up being, here, I'm just going to go ahead and write out the whole thing without, without um, you know, just look at your equation for average energy, uh, hc over lambda, I got my 8 pi from here, um, there's a 1 over lambda from the average energy, and then there's a lambda to the 4, so now I've got lambda to the 5. I've got L cubed on top, but I'm going to divide by L cubed on the bottom. And then I just got my, my last bit from the average energy, which is the exponential. Um, that takes care of temperature. And it's hideous how I've written this. There you go. Oh, oh, D lambda. And that, and that looks awful. Uh, and there we go. And this is the Planck distribution. So what you do, you can plot this. Kind of like, just like what we did with the, with the Boltzmann distribution. And what do you get? You get the 
you get exactly the right thing, which uh, I'll do the digital. You saw that before. Uh, and this is the equation which to use. So we're basically done. Let me show you one last thing, though. One last thing just because it's, it's, it's just something that everyone always explains. I don't, I don't think it's a big deal. Um, so this is it. Oh, but let me just throw this one last thing at you, which is, and I already mentioned this, what you can do, uh, what you can do is integrate this thing. Uh, you can integrate this thing uh, as a function of, I have to be integrating as a function of weight point because there's a partial. So, you, you know, I, I have this partial in there. It's like, it's like wrong of me not to show you what happens when you integrate it. Uh, so what happens is when you integrate it, and I have to, now I have to write the whole damn thing down again, um, what happens is, is that this ends up being related, this, well sorry, this is the amount of energy that comes out of the light bulb um, as a function of size, right? So we, we, this is the energy density, and this ends up being, um, actually I think I'm going to have you do something like this on your homework, and you can just use some online software to do the integration for you. Um, uh, there we go. It's, it's a bunch of hideous constants. Uh, and this, uh, again, because just for your general education, uh, everyone covers this, so I need to show you this. Uh, it's called the Stefan Boltzmann. The Stefan Boltzmann Law. And uh, I think I have just another minute or two. Let me just give you one last little bit of motivation here. One thing that this is useful for is, like, in our fundamental exploration of why do things work, sometimes you may ask, well, what good is that? We often do that just for the hell of it. Like, why are we going to Mars? That I wonder. Anyway, here I actually see something quite useful. <clears throat> now, back in the day, they're building light bulbs for the first time. You might have someone say, well, I want the most powerful light bulb possible. I wonder if I want to make it out of tungsten or molybdenum or titanium. Maybe, but I don't see that information in this, which is, again, the output, power output. I don't see that information in there. What I do see, I see a bunch of constants, but I do see temperature. The one thing I can control. So if you're back in the day and you really, you know, light bulbs, seriously, light bulbs were just invented and it's obviously something that, that's very useful and you were like, well, gee, I really need a powerful one of these. How do I, how do, I do that? A, a fundamental understanding of how it works is going to provide that information. And here you see the only handle you have to adjust this is temperature. Now, of course, that actually does imply that you do want to adjust the material because not any material, you know, what you want, you want the highest melting point temp uh, metal that you can find. Remember, I was telling you last time, that's why they, they use tungsten in the old timey light bulbs versus iron. Iron melts around 1,000, so that's why you have to use tungsten. And if you want a hotter light bulb, you'd have to find uh, even a higher melting point uh, metal. Anyway, so you, you see that sometimes there are just wanderings in mathematical space. They actually can have useful results. All right, next hour, next hour are example problems that will be on the exam. So I, I hope you're there, and I think maybe we'll have a monkey guess as well. So I will see you then.